My name is Krista Santos Morocek, and you are watching the first ever Krista's Corner live. As you may know, I'm the teen correspondent for the Staten Island Advance and SILive.com. I write a column by the same name, Krista's Corner, and this show will complement on a different medium, television. Going forward, I plan to discuss topics of interest to teens as well as adults living on Staten Island and beyond. I also plan to have prominent Staten Islanders on the show, men and women who have had a lasting impact on our borough, whose expertise is unparalleled. I am beyond thrilled to present to you today two incredibly smart and outstanding Staten Islanders. They are leaders in their industries and they are important cogs in the Staten Island wheel. Well, not the Staten Island wheel, but you know what I mean, that's a whole nother show. Please welcome my guest, Mr. Brian Leyline, the well-respected and deeply community-minded executive editor of the Staten Island Advance for the past 23 years, and Mr. Alfred Cerullo III, our former city councilman and president slash CEO of the Grand Central Partnership and a commissioner of the New York City Planning Commission. Both are highly esteemed by so many people, including myself, and I am so glad that they've agreed to be with me here today. Thank you, Mr. Leyline and Mr. Cerullo. Thank you for having us. Pleasure to be here. Mr. Leyland and Mr. Cerullo, I know you two sit or have sat on many boards across Staten Island and currently serve on the Snug Harbor and St. George Theater Board, for which I know you, Mr. Leyland, are the chairman. I also know you two are very good friends, so please tell me how you two first met. Well, uh, I think probably the time we first met when uh, Fred ran for the city council. Mm -hmm. And he came in and visited us for an editorial board. Uh, yes which uh, we did not endorse Fred, but <laughs> that's the first time we met at the editorial. I haven't meeting. forgotten that, by the way. He did win, though. <laughs> that's, win. Usually, that's, usually the trademark. That's, that's usually the trademark. When, when we don't endorse, you win. <laughs> <laughs> that's not true, but, but it is factually correct. <laughs> that was uh, 25 years ago. Hard to believe, but that was exactly just a little over 25 years ago when I would have come in for that editorial board because it was m May of 90 that the election took place. How many so, people ran in that uh, election? Well, it was interesting, and, 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 and this I think is an interesting issue for, for your viewers to understand about how important it is to vote, and as they approach voting age or their new voters, um, there were eight people in that election. It was the city's very first special election, um, which required an actual full election to fill a vacancy in a in a seat in our city as opposed to the parties just selecting somebody to replace the person who had moved on um, seven of us ended up actually running one of them had dropped out just before the election but still remained on the ballot so people went in and just saw a whole slew of names and we couldn't run under our own parties we had to create our own parties because it was a Nonpartisan election. What, what, what party were you? It was uh, Staten Island First. That was the uh, that was my party. Was Staten Island First, and except I appeared second on the on the ballot, um, and so that's when we first met. But it was a, a large group, and I won. And this is the this is the point about how important it is to vote. I won that election by 111 votes, and of course, as I ran for re-election as, as the years went on, th those numbers got a little bit higher, but um, but for a 111 people staying home that day, I, I would not did, have Did anybody won suggest a recount on that because it was so close? Uh, no, no recount, although it took 10 days to certify the election results. So there were many absentee ballots, which we had sent, you know, to people mm -hmm. to fill out. Uh, I remember that being an interesting strategy to make sure because many people can't get out to vote it was the election was in May it's a very busy time for people with graduations and yeah, weddings and communions and confirmation all, other all kinds of celebrations that families get involved in and it also wasn't a typical time to vote so it wasn't as if an election day was on anybody's minds mm -hmm. and it was only the South Shore so it wasn't even a borough-wide you know seat so um, but I remember the election was May 15th and and it was uh, the election results were certified on May 25th, which was the Friday before uh, Memorial Day. 
And I remember going into the city clerk's office to be sworn in and to kick off my actual uh, election on a Memorial Day weekend with many veterans events, ceremonies that weekend, and a parade and all kinds of things. So I think that just very quickly, though, I think that, you know, when, when, when we became, I think, actually friends, though, was yes. after I became editor of the, of the newspaper in 1992. Fred called me and invited me to lunch. Mm -hmm. So my son had a 1965 Mustang that yeah. uh, was in a horrible shape. So I drove it to the restaurant because I was going to take it into a, to a garage afterwards uh, to get it worked on. So as we were leaving the restaurant, Fred saw me get into this Mustang, and uh, he said, "Wow, what is this?" So and I, I had had a '65 T-Bird. Right. So we. Had so I told him a story about my son, and I was going to the garage. He said, "No." He says, "My father is a mechanic in Brooklyn. He had a, right. his father had a, a big garage called Al's Head." Al's Head Service. Yeah. So I said, "Great, we'll take it to your father." And that was the beginning of a long <laughs> friendship with Freddie. With father. many visits to the shop. With many visits across the bridge to the but shop. But that's true. That lunch, I I consider, even though I had known you, um, it. It, that was sort of the beginning of what really grew to be the friendship that right. we have and sort of the partnership we have in many community minded mm -hmm. things and uh, as as you know we've done many co-chair work together on events and certainly co MC work which we have a lot of fun doing and supporting the organizations here on Staten Island that's great that's great yeah. okay so let's change gears a little bit okay let's discuss media and the politics since both of you are iconic in these respects fields. Boy. Mr. Leyline, the media, and Mr. Cerullo, politics. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump is unexpectedly killing it in the polls. Mm -hmm. I personally think his media image has helped him quite a bit from his real estate acumen and his business dealings to owning the Miss USA franchises, pageant franchises, to his hosting Celebrity Apprentice. This is not to mention his unfiltered and outspoken style and his blatant disregard of how president, presidential candidates are expected to act. Mm -hmm. I think the American people like him because they're tired of the same old, same old. They're looking for someone who is going to go out there and do different things. They're shying away from career politicians and they're going for Trump because of their current dislike of the Obama administration. It's very possible that Americans are yearning for a change for someone who is willing to stir the pot up a little bit. So Mr. Leyline and Mr. Cerullo, why do you think that Donald Trump is so popular? Well, I think uh, I think that uh, it says a lot about the electorate. I think I think that um, you know when I was growing up, uh, you talked about presidential timber. Mm -hmm. That was always the phrase, and it meant the you know how, as you said, Krista, how a how a candidate presents him or herself. And when I was growing up, it was always himself. A, a woman would never run for president in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Thank God that's all changed today. Um, but I think, uh, I don't want to say the electorate has dumbed down, but they are definitely, when you look at what people enjoy to watch on television, it's reality shows. And this is becoming a reality mm -hmm. show. You know, I don't think that anybody is analyzing Donald Trump's positions or policies. We frankly don't know a lot about his policies. He just released a policy paper uh, yesterday on, on immigration, which is which is a bit bizarre. I mean, for example, he, he wants to uh, el eliminate birthright citizenship, which means if you're born in America of immigrant parents, you're immediately a citizen. He wants to end that. He can't end that. Mm -hmm. y y I think you need three quarters of vote of the Congress and three quarters of the state legislatures have to approve it. That will never happen. Happen. But people don't know that, so they're eating that up. You know, I, I agree, and I, I think that you sort of outlined a whole host of reasons why he has the popularity he has right now. And to tie into sort of the reality show example, there is, and this is really, I think, where the media and the politics come together. You know, we're living in an age where between uh, t television, the television medium having thousands of channels to fill time with every day, the fact that there is an incredible um, imposition is the word, but some people deserve it and some people don't, on the lives of people in politics. And 
and social media and you know the incredible growth of social media in every possible form whether it's just you know one you know one photograph that gets sent to somebody or it's people actually communicating through Twitter or even text messaging simple things instantaneously we know everything there is to know about everybody but generally what we're learning are things that are not positive and so the way people people have always um, felt uh, not positively generally about politicians I mean even the sound of that is negative that you know the word has yeah. a sort of negative connotation yes. um, but now we're learning about other things about all these people so it has the electorate quite discouraged about who it is and who's out there for them so when they have somebody like Donald Trump who comes out he says whatever's on his mind it it's it's almost as if that is what's being embraced. It's like, okay, he's just a real guy. He's not a politician, but there's an entertainment factor. Um, and people aren't looking at the career politicians anymore because there's the, the, the confidence level in them has definitely um, been minimized over the years. And that's, that's a sort of a partnership between the media and politics because we learn through the media but the politicians and the, the politics of it the, they're doing the actions it's just being reported more often all day long constantly and I think people are refreshed by somebody they don't view as a politician saying whatever's on their mind the real question is that's today as time gets closer to an election whether whether it's a primary election or a general election, does that carry through or do people start either one, stay home or two, start weeding out and start paying more attention to the actual issues and not the entertainment? That I think it's in this providing. particular case, though, I think I think this I think this has staying power, this particular one. Oh, I, I agree. I think because I think the media is driving this mm -hmm. one. When you have a when you have a field of 16 candidates, yes, they have to focus on somebody because mm -hmm they need to entertain you because Absolutely. as you said there's a thousand channels out there that need and you need All 24 hours a day you need to be filled so th there was no, I mean, Donald Trump said he will spend one billion dollars on this campaign he doesn't have to no he's getting he can't the buy what he's what he's sure. getting here yes. yesterday he had a report to jury duty yeah. it became the trial of the century yeah. simply because this one person was on jury duty I think the difference I mean if we're going to take it from that level presidential politics to the local level of politics I think we do things entirely different in Staten Island and I think this is where yes. where uh, presidential politics could, could learn a lesson because in, in, for the most part on Staten Island the political people can work together for the most part. Yes. But they also can work with the media. And that's not just the Staten Island advance. It's New York no. 1. We, 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 we form a, a partnership. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's adversarial, adversarial journalism and there's advocacy journalism. And both of them have their good points and their bad points. Absolutely. But I, I prefer advocacy journalism because we look to better a community, and that's and you need to partnership. You need a partnership with the local political establishment. Yes. You absolutely need it. And, and we're very lucky in that way here. I mean, we do have our elected officials will always tend to work together on, especially on the important issues for the for the borough. But what troubles me about the 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 local elected today. Um, and this didn't exist in your time when you were elected, is, is social media. Mm -hmm. oh, because yeah. the, the electeds are using social media to get their message out. Mm -hmm. Now that's great, but they're only getting the message out to the, to, to the I think, narrow group of people who, who follow them somehow on social media, whether it be Twitter, whether it be mm -hmm. Facebook, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. They're not getting their message out all the time through a general interest newspaper like the Staten Island Advance mm -hmm. that, appeals, that, that would appeal to a Republican, a Democrat, a conservative, or a liberal. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know how they, in all honesty, I, I don't envy this chapter, and who knows what comes next, because there clearly will be something that comes next in terms of communication, but I, I don't know how they manage dealing with the standard bearers of, of news delivery and people they don't even know that they're reaching and, and even worse is the I'll call it sort of the, bl the blog interaction where faceless nameless you know people 
get to comment on every possible thing that's going on, good or bad, and that's just out there forever too. So there's so much to manage. I, it's really, mm -hmm. and, and I don't know where it goes. I don't know, you know, I realize that, you know, regulating that is not ever going to be something that happens and probably should not. But uh, at the same time, it's it's a lot to manage, I think. And mm -hmm. But I, I, I think, Brian, you said it right. Our community is a really good example for people to look at to see how it best can work. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. And at the Republican presidential debate, Fox newscaster Megyn Kelly was very frank with Donald Trump, and she challenged some of his comments in the past. And now her job might be in jeopardy. She said that Trump called women he didn't like, and I quote, pigs, dogs, slobs, and disgusting animals. And then she said he had disparaging comments about women's looks on his Twitter. She then asked him if he had the temperament to become president. Personally, I thought that she was fearless and she did a great job. But do you think that she should lose her job over the comments that she made to Trump? Well, I can guarantee you this. Megyn Kelly might have written the questions, but they were vetted by about 50 people. Yeah. So if anybody's going to lose their job, there should be 51 people, those 50 and her. No, of course she shouldn't lose her job. I, I'm not sure they were the right questions to ask in a presidential debate right. up front. I'm not saying they shouldn't have been a part of the debate. But I think you can go back, you know, the, 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 there's always the wow factor. Um, I remember I was interviewed on a, a radio show, and uh, much like today, they, they don't give you the questions up front. But when I did sit down, he said, I'm going to ask you this particular question. It was a mild question. It was harmless. So I sit down, and this was just during the secession movement, and the mayor of the city of New York called me personally and the Staten Island Advance racists because we put out a, uh, a, a high school uh, uh, curriculum on secession, and the mayor Dinkins at the time was totally against secession. So he tells me he's going to ask me this harmless question about how long you've been working at the Staten Island Advance, and he goes out and he gets in my face and he says, "You've been accused of being a racist by the mayor," and like you know, it's, it's, it knocks you yeah. back a little bit. And I think that's yeah. what she was trying to do a little bit with 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 Trump. And also, let's frank, let's be frank. You, you need you need viewership. You need numbers. That mm -hmm. debate was watched by twice as many people who had watched the debate in years, and yeah. that's what it's all about. And because I, numbers translate into advertising. Correct. And I and I think the I mean to answer your question, absolutely not. She should not lose her job over this unless there was some agreement in advance that she broke. But I don't personally think that anything that happened that night was that outrageous. I mean, the questions were interesting. I don't know that I'd want to be asked those questions in that forum. But I think, you know, he he handled them as Donald Trump handles anything. He kind of kind of like went away. He answered them. He was tough. He stuck to his guns. She stuck to her guns. And the, you know, the, the debate moved on. But I think in the long run, based on the attention this issue has gotten, I don't see this necessarily being detrimental to her career at all. No, not at all. I see this as being actually something that puts her in this international spotlight that she might not otherwise have had the opportunity to be in, absent some other story that she might have been involved in. And I'm not saying that, that the give and take is worth that, but I definitely don't think she should lose her job for it, but I also think that in the long run it'll play out very positively for her in her career. There's no doubt about it. She, that was a win-win you know, for her. A, it was a win-win for her. The people who didn't like the question loved, loved Trump's her. answers. Correct. The people who liked the question respected her for doing it. It's a win-win. It's a win-win for both of them, frankly. For both of them. I, I mean, he hit, he hit a home run the minute he mentioned Rosie O'Donnell in the beginning. Right. So. Mm -hmm. And uh, Chris Wallace confronted Donald Trump about his comments on Mexicans being criminals and rapists. Wallace asked Trump, what evidence do you have, specific evidence, that the Mexican government is sending criminals across the border? He started off by saying, if it weren't for me, you wouldn't even be talking about illegal immigration. This Which is was, not true. This was not a subject on anybody's mind until I brought it up. Then he continued by saying, our leaders are stupid, our politicians are stupid, and the Mexican government is much smarter, much sharper, much more cunning, and they send the bad ones over because they don't want to pay for them. They don't want to take care of them. So, Mr. Leyline and Mr. Cerullo, what do you think about these audacious comments, and do you think Donald Trump is a racist? Hmm. Well, I don't think
don't think Donald Trump is a racist. I wouldn't go as far as saying that. But I think that there's certain levels of inappropriateness to some of his comments, and it plays, unfortunately, to people who have, certainly people that have points of view that don't help move the country forward or keep it open for constructive discussion or debate. So I, it's problematic to me. I don't think it makes him a racist. I think there are a lot of people who agree with him, but I think there are more people who disagree with him. You know, I don't know how he gets away with saying nobody would be talking about this because immigration has been a topic for, for 20 years. Right. I remember Fred's predecessor was Susan Molinari. <clears throat> when did she leave office? Uh, to, to, like com Congress? No, uh, uh, Congress. City, uh, 97. So she, Susan left Congress in 1997. I recall the last editorial board meeting we had with her. That was my first question to her. Mm -hmm. What do we do with the illegal immigration? So for Mr. Trump to say that nobody would be talking about it, I don't think that's quite true. But on the, on the racist thing, no, I, I wouldn't say that. But I mean, there's cer there certainly is a level of intolerance there. Yeah. Um, Okay, let's uh, lighten up the conversation a little bit and let's talk about name recognition versus experience. Who do you think should win the upcoming DA race? Ooh. Well, I can't <laughs> I give an can't answer on it either. <laughs> yeah, that's a two -time. But I think it's an interesting race. I think when you, when you pit a uh, career prosecutor mm -hmm. who clearly has an incredible track record as a Manhattan assistant district attorney who prosecuted hate crimes and sex crimes for over 20 years against a, I'm going to use the phrase career politician, but not in a bad way, uh, uh, against a Staten Islander who has represented this community on different levels of government, as well as in, in the uh, the uh, private sector through nonprofit work. I think it's an interesting race. Oh, it's. I think. I, I, I think. Just the last thing, I, uh, you know, before Frig jumps in, I think oh. from the political side, from the media side. Um, if I and I will have them sitting down in front of each other, I would ask them, you know, what really is the role of the district attorney as opposed to the 20 or 30 or 40 ADAs you have who, who really run the office? I think it's, first of all, frankly, it's raising money to, to fund the office of the DA because mm -hmm. that's part of the job. But also, it's setting the tone. It's setting the tone as a leader for your assist, assist, assistant mm -hmm. district attorneys. And it's choosing a path where you want that office to take. I'm sure they both have that in mind, and they and they will can and will do that. I think the question that a voter should ask him or herself is, what should that tone be? Where do I want to see my DA's office? Mm -hmm. Well, just to build off that, because I, I agree with exactly what uh, Brian is saying. I mean, I think this is one of those circumstance, those situations where Staten Islanders have both uh, in, in a really difficult choice and a really easy one. And and what I mean by that is it's a difficult one because the two candidates are, are both two people who could do this job very well, um, and they both bring a great deal to the table. But it's an easy one because whoever becomes a district attorney, I think, will have the best interests of, you know, obviously the island and the office in their day-to-day -day function. So it's a, it's a tough one. Um, this is going to be clearly an election that is about getting the vote out. Um, no matter how people feel about f philosophically, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, or whether they lean more uh, liberal or moderate, or they're more conservative, the reality is it, it only matters who actually comes out to vote. So both sides are going to have to do an incredible job of getting people to come out and to vote that day, because me, that's going to make the difference let, in let who me, wins. Let me ask you both a question, and maybe you can give us a perspective as a younger person on this. This is supposed to be an office that is untouched, untainted by any, mm -hmm. certainly corruption, mm -hmm. but also favoritism and, 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 and politics. Mm -hmm. But let's be frank, it's a, it's a, this is a political election. It's a Democrat and a Republican running. Of course. So do you think that this should be an election, or should there be some kind of an appointment process? Some judges are elected, some judges are appointed. Mm -hmm. So should the district attorney in a county where you have Republicans, Democrats, conservatives, and liberals living, should there be an appointment and not an election? 
Well, do you have, feel free to go first if you like. I mean, I have a, I have a thought of, about that, but. I think that they're doing it right with the election because being appointed, you don't really get to know the person. What if it's, you know, what if it is corrupt and you don't know the person? But I think I, they're doing it right. I would say it's an interesting question that this is the first time I'm even contemplating which might be the better way to do it. But I will say this, even in the appointment process, the underlying foundation is a political mm -hmm. one. So you're not avoiding the ultimate goal. You're better off having people politic, but the general public is coming to the booth to pull the lever. An appointment is one person still with a group of political structure around them making the choice. That choice is gonna be based on the same issues that you'd be concerned about in the election, which is favoritism, who donated money to my campaign, who do they know. Appointments still play into the political process. So you're gonna take a dim view of it like that. You know, yeah. Well I mean and, and again this is not well thought out. It's just sort of my immediate take is that's actually a very interesting point but you're not avoiding the political piece of it because the appointment process is just as political. No, but you do have a real vetting process. I mean, I think Mike Bloomberg did it right. I think mm -hmm. he have probably appointed as many Democrats as judges as he Again, did that's Republican been, judges. And you're right, and there were some people, I've had appointments too. I mean, I'd like to think that there was yeah. some substance and credibility to those appointment, appointments, not just yeah. some political um, world that I live in. However, the reality is the, at least the person who takes the job remains accountable to the public it's serving. Mm -hmm. And it isn't, it's not just the accountability sort of gets, you know, it either goes to someone else. It's, it's the public's accountability for selecting the person, and it's the person's accountability who serves in the seat. When you have an appointment, there's another layer of accountability. You know, you eliminate the public for the most part, and you are now have someone else who's accountable for that appointment. So I, I don't know. It, it's an interesting debate. We probably could have an, in, you know, uh, do a whole show on that issue alone, but. Um, I think right now I probably agree with you that the election process is probably the fairest and least political, as political as it may be. Yeah, the, 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 in this particular election, though, much has been said, what you, they do in every election, about how much money can you raise. Right. I mean, I, I think it's a no-brainer to say Mike McMahon can raise a heck of a lot more money mm -hmm. than Joe and Alouzi can. Right. So. Oh, well, that, that's very interesting and you're right we could talk for hours about this because it is big but you know they are doing it right and um so yeah well that concludes my first ever carissa's corner live and i hope that everybody enjoyed it as much as i did i'd like to thank mr brian leyline and mr fred cerullo for being on my show and hopefully they'll come back and see us again soon I'd love to would love it until then just remember people will forget what you said but they'll never forget how you made them feel thank you Thank you for being here.